in Sunday school, we shared from the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5 through 7. And, uh, and that begins with us being told that Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down. And the reason that he sat down was because in Jesus' time, when a teacher or a rabbi would sit down, uh, it signified, listen up. So, listen up. You know, there are a lot of figures of speech out there. One of those is what we know as a, an oxymoron. An oxymoron are words or statements that are seemingly inconsistent with each other. Things like a deafening silence or clearly confused or cheerful pessimist. My favorite is jumbo shrimp. <laughs> it, it can be a phrase. It can be things like I'm busy doing nothing and... Andy Warhol said, I am deeply superficial. And then my other favorite was, I'm just made a 12 ounce pound cake. Well, <laughs> think about that for a minute. And in some ways, the, the words of some verses, and I'm thinking of Psalm 111.10, here's what it says. It says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And, and it appears to be somewhat at odds within itself. Uh, Knowing what to fear is definitely part of wisdom. But seeing fear of the Lord and wisdom in the same verse uh, just seems a bit out of place. But not only are we told that the fear of the Lord is the pathway to wisdom, we're also told that it's the beginning of wisdom. And I want to share about that with you this morning, a very, very important uh, topic for us to address as we continue sharing from Acts chapter 2, and that's the fear of God or the fear of the Lord. And if you got your Bibles, we're going to move on uh, to a part of verse 43 in Acts chapter 2. We've been walking through that, uh, not only verse by verse, but we've been breaking some of those verses down, and today we find ourselves at verse 43. And there it says this, it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, I share with you about oxymoron, because when you look at verse 42, which says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers, that is immediately followed by, Then fear came upon every soul, it, it, it almost looks a bit like an oxymoron. That is, that the joy and devotion and commitment that we see being evidenced in verse 42 is immediately followed by this fear. And it's very important today as we share that we understand exactly what type of fear we're talking about here. What we're seeing here and what we'll, we see described in Scripture and when it talks about the fear of God is not a cowering what's going to happen to me type of emotion, uh, at least for the believer. What we're talking about here is a reverential awe of God. And if you will, a, a recognition and response to his magnificence and his uniqueness. And, and when we go through these verses, we find a sequence that not only characterize the early church, but it also is something which should be evident in the life of every believer and the life of every true Christian church. And as we often share, just one little word in here can mean so very much. Because notice how verse 43 begins. It says, then. Now, if you've been around, you know that I, I love to look at those words that connect the verses. Because nothing's in here by chance. And, and that little verb, then, is, is typically or normally an adverb, and it just denotes a sequence. Uh, I went to Sunday school, then I went to the worship service. But when we see it in verse 43, as it begins, it's not talking chronologically, and it's not, not talking necessarily about uh, time. And to fully understand what it means as it says then, we have to go back and we have to see what's taking place that led to this fear of the Lord that came upon every believer. And 
know, sometimes I think that some of the great lessons in the Bible are actually found in between the verses. And that sounds a little bit strange. But, but certainly that's the case when you look at verses 41 and 42 of Acts chapter 2. Verse 41 says this, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So here's 3,000 new believers to go with about 120 that are already there. Then in verse 42 it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, some versions say teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, which was the Lord's Supper, and prayers. And, and when you step back and you look at Acts chapter 2, you see this progression that's taking place. That is, the Holy Spirit has arrived as Jesus promised he would at Pentecost. Peter has preached the gospel. People have been convicted by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Many have repented, turned away from a life that was away from God, and they have turned to God and sought him through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. They have been baptized because of their repentance. And then they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each of their lives. Now, now if we stop right there, what we realize is, and, and hopefully remind ourselves again, is that, that nothing in this book is there by chance. There's not a single word that just appears because... There was, they needed to fill up a page. There wasn't some scribe back there 1,900, 2,000 years ago that was copying this down that went, you know what, this would sound better. I think I'll just put that in there. God has directed everything that is in here. And he's told us that there's 3,000 new believers. Now, that's just not an issue of, boy, this would be a great potluck dinner now. Or Peter on his resume puts, by the way, I preached and 3,000 people were saved. But he's telling us that things are happening and things happening between the conversion or regeneration of 3,000 and this, in this, this devotion that you see evidenced in verse 42. And what's happened is that these, holy, these new believers have received the Holy Spirit and he's dwelling in them, but he's not sitting dormant. He's at work in their lives, convicting them of this need for righteousness that is moving them, pushing them through this progression of spiritual growth. And in all likelihood, Peter probably has sat back and says, what do we do now? And these believers have said, what happens next? And the Holy Spirit says, I got this covered. I know exactly what is supposed to happen now. That when you have this regeneration, this new birth, and when you have believers who are filled with and responsive to the Holy Spirit, then this is what happened. In the case of the early church, they began listening to the teachings of the apostles. They began understanding and, and appreciating this bond, this fellowship that existed between them because of their faith. They followed the command of Jesus Christ, who said, do this, the Lord's Supper, in remembrance of me, and keep doing it until I came, come back because I am resurrected. And they understood that we need to be in constant communication with the Father through prayer. And as you walk through that, God says, let me give you the word that follows all of that. Then, then fear came upon every soul. Now, we're going to share about that today and walk through about that. But I want us to understand when we look at these verses and we share about the early church, that we're not just looking at some historical account and we're not looking at some just random, okay, tell them what's happening. There is a divine order to this, a divine sequence to what's happening in Acts and what we see here today as we move to Acts 2 verse 43 where we talk about fear coming upon every soul. And we need to understand that when God gives us this, he's not giving us some checklist that we can look down and go, okay, we got that, we got that, we got this. It's much deeper than that. God says, I'm going to give you a model. I'm going to give you an example for how my church should function, how it should grow, and what it should do to show the world who I am, to bring glory to me, and to reach out to those who will know me. 
Now I want you to go back to the first part of verse 43. And here's what it said. New King James Version, it says, Then fear came upon every soul. If you go back and you look at the Greek word that's used for fear, it actually means terror or fright. Um, but when we get to fear in the setting of the context of the fear of God or the fear of the Lord, this is not that frightful emotion that we think of often when we think of fear. And to help us understand that better, let me share with you a little bit of what other translations say in verse 43. When you look at the English Standard Version, it says this, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. When you get to the New American Standard Bible, it says that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. The New International Version says everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Now all of those versions use the word awe. Now listen folks, if you've got a New King James like me, don't think uh-oh, wrong word. No, it's the right word. It's the same Greek word for every one of them. And the word is phobos. It is the word from which we get phobia. Phobia is an irrational fear, unless it's heights or snakes, and then it's very rational. <laughs> but you see, there's a huge difference when you talk about phobos in terms of an irrational fear, and you talk about phobos in terms of this reverential awe of God. And I like to... to to see and describe and even define this fear of God in the early church and in what it's supposed to be for us as this just deep sense of reverence and awe and wonder at who God is. And you see that it's very important that we note what's happening here. What you see here is this conviction and you see this belief and you see these things taking place and you see particularly that what's resulting from that, this fear or this awe of God, is not something that's limited to time or place. In fact, if you think back to the New American Standard Bible that we just put on the screen and how it describes this, it says this, everyone kept feeling, kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. You see, this reverential awe wasn't limited to an hour on Sunday mornings. It wasn't limited to a particular time of the week or a particular place. But it was continuous and it was internal and it was external because it was an expression of the response to who God is. And I want to tell you, folks, sadly, sadly, Today in our world and in the Christian churches or professed Christian churches of today, many have lost that feeling of awe and magnificence. Let me date you a little bit. The year is 1964. Many of you weren't even here. But it was shortly before that the two guys, Bobby Hatfield and Bill Medley, got together, they formed a group they're called the Righteous Brothers. Greatest hit ever, Unchained Melody. However, 1964, they took a song that had been written by uh, Philip Spector, uh, Phil Spector, and had been written by Barry Mann and a lady named Cindy Weil, and they uh, recorded it. It became the number one hit in England and the United States, and it became number four five best-selling song of 1965. It was called You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Some of you right now in this moment are playing it in your mind. <laughs> Remember that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what it is. I share that because of this. Folks, here's the reality. Too many folks have lost that godly feeling. Too many folks don't understand that knee-bending God acknowledging, God responding, awareness that overcomes you. 
when you think of who he is and all that he is. And God tells us about the early church because it was there. And it wasn't just there in passing. It wasn't just there because of newness. It was there because of what had happened in their lives and how they responded to it. You see, the fear of the Lord is not an option in the life of the believer, and it's not something reserved for the spiritually mature. 3,000 of these people are new believers. They're brand new believers, and they're growing, but as they grow, they're coming to understand exactly who God is. And the Bible makes it very, very clear, crystal clear, that the fear of the Lord is so important to him. And I can give you a bunch of examples. Let's just take the book of Proverbs. Nine times minimum in the book of Proverbs, it talks about the fear of the Lord. Let's put them up here. Here's just some of them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It is to hate evil. It is a strong confidence. It is the fountain of life. It is the instruction of wisdom. It is that which leads to life. Do you think this matters to God? Sure it does. It's all important to him. I want you to think about this. Not only has God said in this book, I'm telling you exactly how important it is, but let me tell you something else. I have surrounded you with who I am so that every moment of your life should be spent in awe of the creator. Romans 1 verse 20 says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, sometimes we read that and we say, well, let me tell you what, God's put himself out there so that people will say, there is a God. I want to know who this God is. I want to know more about him. They are drawn to him. Absolutely correct. Don't miss this point, folks. He's put himself around us so every one of his children would look around and, and be reminded of exactly who he is, and we would respond in this reverential awe that shows itself everywhere and in everything. You see, the fear of God that we're talking about is not just something that comes out of our mouth and words that we say. It's a lifestyle. It's something that's so evident in who we are. And it was in the early church. In the coming weeks, what we're going to see is that this fear of God that has been brought about because of their growing and understanding and knowledge of him is going to show itself in a lot of different ways out in the world. We'll talk about that. But when it comes to our church and we ask ourselves exactly how can we take this and how can we apply this, there's so many different ways. I want to share one with you. If you got your Bibles there, turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, turn to verse or chapter 7. Second Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I want you to focus in on those last few words, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Leviticus 11, 1 Peter 1, God said this, be holy as I am holy. God says, I am set apart, I am distinct, I am unique. That's what it means to be holy. You as my people are to be set apart, you are to be distinct, so much so that when people see you, they know who you belong to, more importantly, They want to know who I am. You see, it's through our holiness that God is displayed and others are drawn to him. And here what we're told is that that holiness, that perfection of holiness is something that we seek and we pursue and we perfect through the fear of God. And it necessarily follows that in the absence of that reverential awe, that we will not perfect the holiness that God commands in us. 
And when I step back and I look at the early church and I see what's happening in these descriptions in here, let me tell you something, folks. I don't see here a response to, boy, we got a beautiful new building. I don't see a response here that says, you know what, we've got all these wonderful programs. I don't see a response that says we've got the most charismatic teachers and preachers and pastors in the whole world. What I see is a spirit-filled, God-fearing nature that has now become who they are as followers of Jesus Christ. And sadly today, too many churches have superimposed over these verses, their own standards of what it means to be in fear of God and pursuing this holiness and displaying this holiness. Let me tell you, attendance may matter, but I will promise you that it's not the sole measure of the fear of God. Responding to needs that are outside these doors and inside this place is very important. It is not the sole measure of the fear of God. What we see in the early church and these believers was an ongoing response to the transformation that's taken place in their lives because they have become believers in Jesus Christ and now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And what we should see in each other, in this sanctuary, in your home, in your workplace, on the golf course, on a ball field, wherever you go, wherever I go, what should be seen is this incredible awe of God himself. Now, I shared with you an oxymoron. Don't think I'm weird. I'm going to share with you a paradox. They're just illustrations that hopefully under, help us understand better the lessons that God has in here. And, and a, a paradox is typically two statements that are seemingly contradictory to each other. And, and there is a paradox in the Christian life that just fascinates me. And this is it. God commands us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of Him and in our intimacy, our closeness with Him. But as we grow closer to God, we realize how distant we are from Him. Now, that's not a bad thing. Because, you see, that's where this all comes from. This all comes from understanding that this distinct, unique God, the creator of everything that is, this one who has chosen to love us and to offer to us this incredible gift of salvation, is there and is deserving of everything that we can give him. And I want to tell you, I, I can't help but have just a simplistic view of what it's supposed to be like. And you know where you get that? You get it from a kid. You get it from a child. You ever walked along with a child or a grandchild or somebody? You've got business to do. You're going from A to B. You just want to get there. That kid's going along and all of a sudden they see a feather on the ground or a rock or something that is seemingly meaningless to us, and all of a sudden they stop, and they pick it up, and you see in their face this incredible wonder. You see, it's like this. It's just overcome. And folks, that's what it needs to be. You know, that's what it needs to be for all of us, all of the time. It's just this constant wonder at the nature of God. You know, for years and years and years, on, on the mirror in my bathroom, I kept a little piece of paper, about that big. And it came off one of those calendars, you know, you put on your desk and they got something on them, you tear them off or every day or whatever. And it was on there and I tore it off. It was a quote, I think the guy's name was Timothy Heller. And here's what he said. It just said this, when I grow up, I want to be a little boy. You know, people see that and say, that's silly. Let me tell you what, folks, when it comes to the awe of God, I want to have the wonder of a child because I'm a little boy in the family of God. No matter how long I grow, no matter how far I grow, I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, I need to be fascinated by, mesmerized by, obedient to every single thing that he is. We cannot lose that. We have to pursue that. 
We have to embrace that. We have to live that. You often hear us say, when you enter this sanctuary, that we should be overcome by the presence of God. And that's true. But let me tell you something, folks. In just a few minutes, you're going to go out these doors. When you go out those doors, you should maintain and be constantly in awe of our God. Let me tell you about him. This God who surrounds us with himself. This God who is deserving of everything that we can give him. Is a God in his uniqueness who said, you can't come to me, but I'll come to you. I will leave the perfection of heaven to walk among those who will ridicule me, persecute me, spit upon me, who will torture me, who will place me on a cross, and they'll kill me. But I will do it so that you will have the means by which you can be mine. And that which separates you will be gone. Now, God could have made it any way he wanted but he said, you know, what I want is faith. God could have put in every mailbox a DVD of everything, but then it'd be sight. So I said, here's what I want. I want you to believe. I really want you to believe that I love you that much that I did that. And not only do I want you to believe it, I want you to live it said, because becoming part of my family is not a momentary thing in the same way that being in awe of me is not a momentary thing. I said, understand this, that what it takes to be my child is faith in what I'm offering you from my love and my grace. But he said, I also want you to understand that I've got great plans for you. He tells us that in Ephesians 2.10. He said, I've prepared things for you to do. And the way that you do that is by giving me control of your life and letting my son be your Lord. And so inherent in that invitation that God gives is this. I want to give you an eternity that is secure through your faith, but I also want all of you right now. Now, folks, we don't downplay that. I don't care what you say, what you do. That is the most important decision in all of life period. There is no greater decision. And there's no more important moment in all of life for someone who hasn't made it than right now. And that's not a preacher's plea. That's the heart of God himself. So we have an invitation. An invitation is just an opportunity to profess what's already in your heart. Nobody walks down to the front, talks to me, and gets saved. You get saved because God loves you. He's offered it to you. The Holy Spirit convicts you. You repent. You accept. You believe. And you live. But if you do that, what God says is, I want you to not be ashamed of me. And so we have an opportunity here for folks to come forward. And for the first time, often, to publicly profess that I've made this decision, that Jesus Christ is now my Savior and Lord. I'm going to live a life for him. It's an opportunity to say, God, put me right here, right here in this place to live out my Christian life as part of this body of believers. Whatever decision you make, understand this. We as a church are going to follow the examples of Acts 2, and we as believers are going to follow these examples, and I pray be constantly, constantly in awe of our God. Let's bow together.